Questioners and, and uh, the panelists, to limit your question uh, within a minute, a very, make it very simple and short. And then also when uh, the panelists can answer to the questions, just to use about uh, less than uh, two minutes if possible, uh, so that uh, we can uh, invite more questions uh, from the floor. Uh, already, uh, Focus Duara has a question, so please. I'll try to keep it very short. Two quick questions. Uh, one general and one uh, specific. Uh, it seems to me that this uh, project at the center appears to be, at obviously the leader, more about Northeast Asia and the West rather than really a notion of uh, Asia, uh, especially in its southern dimensions. Um, so could you clarify that and tell us how you conceive of that? Uh, my specific question to uh, Professor Lee is uh, you have very interesting materials, but I wonder if you began to include the environmental costs and other invisible costs, uh, how your, uh, your charts and maps and conclusions would look. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're, we're going to collect a few questions and then have an answer afterwards. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, I enjoy uh, all the presentations. I was a little uh, surprised that uh, no one mentioned uh, perhaps the most uh, central issue facing uh, North Asia today, which is uh, tensions over history and, and territories. So now, uh, as a center of Asia, not only of your country, but as a center of you know, Asian studies, how can we help to improve the situation? Because I mean, we can talk about a lot of issues, and oftentimes you know, those issues are taken by politicians and media and so on. So as a leading academic, a leading uh, Asia center in Japan, Korea, China, what can we do? Uh, any question? Uh, uh, if not, Professor Lee, uh, you can answer to the viewers' question first, and then. Thank you, Professor Lee, about raising the issue about environmental cost of the growth in general. As a humanitarian, uh, one of the key concepts. Uh, in this place, it's called leapfrogging. Leapfrogging means that uh, jumping toward the uh, next emerging technology or hands. And we apply this concept to the environmental cleanliness curve. Original cleanliness curve is about a relationship between income growth and uh, inequality. That means inequality growing initially, but they don't decrease. You can draw the same graph. Uh, environmental cost wise, environmental cost increase, they don't decrease. But if you follow the same path, it will be disaster for the whole world. And if you China in the follow the same path of the current rich countries, there will be too much environmental cost. The idea of reprogramming or path creating is that you can skip the middle stages. In other words, you cannot go to the top, the mountain portion of the uh, the cup and bypassing directly to the uh, more environmentally friendly uh, position in, along the curve. That's what I mean. We can uh, create new paths, we can leapfrog into uh, alternative kind of growth and, and, and to say the coastal environment. That's the uh, humanitarian idea. And again, we believe that science and technology is the only key solution to this environment problem caused by climate growth. So, so only do new science, technology, innovation, we can find uh, new ways to grow with the less cost environment. And uh, again, I will take for the next million or what this uh, applying this concept of leapfrogging or past creation and to uh, have sustainable growth in both economic account and also environmental. Okay, if you have a question, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Sidney did just uh, the raise your uh, the name plate and then I'll designate you uh, as a questioner. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I just asked Professor Yinayam to, uh, to reply to uh, uh, the questions raised by Professor Shin. 
Well, it's very interesting, very difficult question to answer. Well, uh, last year, last September, I organized one the, the East Asia Community Forum in Tokyo, the, the, uh, including Chinese, Chinese scholar from, uh, and Korean scholar and Japanese scholar. One of the sessions touched upon the issue of history and especially territory. Uh, I expect some tension, of course. The Chinese scholar, you know, utilize that conference as to push their government position. Japanese scholar is, you know, we know, tend to have a more autonomy, academic autonomy. So some scholar uh, express some, you know, more non-national position, but some scholar express for nationalist position. But uh, after the, the some, you know, the, the uh, heated debate the, uh, among uh, between China and China, the, the Japanese scholar regarding the Senkak issue, and in the end of the, you know, the, the conference session, the perspective of China, and they expressed to the Chinese and Japanese colleagues expressed some degree of understanding of other countries' colors. So I do, I don't believe having, you know, a conference or discussing issue easily the, uh, overcome all this tension. But at least it's better than ignoring the issue. So when the territory issue or history issue, the government level, you know, sort of uh, confrontation, without the, the engaging in dialogue, there is no way, opportunity to overcome. So, you know, maybe at least having the opportunity to uh, put the agenda on the table, and at least we can have a mutual understanding. What, what are the main problems? What are the main issues? Then after the, you know, the, the session, the conference, and next year, the Chihuahua University hosts uh, another forum. And we try to include the same session. Maybe you know, next year we will have a sort of a solution. So what can the, uh, the academia can do in overcoming the confrontation at the level of uh, the government. So that way, the, the, uh, we can the, uh, make the progress. But otherwise, it, there is no easy solution, in my opinion. Okay, uh, professor Green. Uh, Dr. Green is uh, Professor Green is the director of the Institute of uh, East Asian Studies at UCL. Well, Yes, a few speakers have already mentioned the topic of developing non-Western approaches to Asian studies, and I assume this is going to be a theme of the conference. It's certainly the reason why I'm here uh, to learn about them. I have a question that actually reaches more back to Professor Guara's uh, keynote address uh, about this topic. Um, he spoke about having a normative, ethnically, ethnically infused notion of Asian studies. Uh, and I would say that is certainly something that we, we want to be thinking about. There, there, there's no doubt about that. But when I was first becoming an Asian Studies person, there were two things that all of us were trying to avoid. Uh, genealogy and ethnocentrism. And I'd say at the heart of both of it was a normative, ethically driven notion of how the world should develop. So I spent all my career looking at how people are getting run over by capitalism, how people are getting run over by change. Yet when I go to China and I gave a talk recently, and somebody asked me, oh, okay, are you on the peasant side or are you on the government side? <laughs> so like, I, this is not really the way I look at what I do. Uh, there's something different going on here. So my question is, and this is a little provocative, but it's moving, is sustainable modernity, is that just the latest normative, ethically driven way of looking at Asian studies that's going to be bringing Western values? And who can, dis who can disagree with sustainability? It sounds like something that none of us could disagree with. But a lot of these other ethical, normatively driven ways of looking at Asian studies also came uh, from the West. And is this something that we want to be working toward or having the same kind of concerns? As we didn't have a QA session for the keynote speech, I will give two minutes to Professor Gura to comment on this. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I think the first thing is that. Uh, 
I don't think that this notion of sustainable modernity is ethnocentric. I think it, it is uh, a situation when the world has become very much aware. The problem is, in fact... And everybody in this room has to acknowledge it wherever they're from. Yes, I think so. So it's not Western. It's certainly not Western, is what I'm saying. Uh, I think the problem is, is, if anything, it's a national problem. What uh, uh, the gentleman I was talking about, Mutsuyoshi uh, Ishura, uh, talks about is that every time there's a discussion, whether in Kyoto or Durban or Rio or something, you have the US and the Chinese quarreling about who goes first when you want to control carbon credits, right? You basically have to control it. Uh, there is a certain, they worked out the plans. Right? In, uh, in 50 years, to limit it to 2% growth. Uh, and, but the whole thing is that we cannot go back to our people and say that we are going to control it. And look at what happened in Australia. The one place which did it, Abbott had to go back. And he went back, and the kind of national side of it, he went up uh, to go back. So, firstly, I don't think it's an ethnocentric. Of course, normatives uh, have their, uh, have anything that's normative has politics that takes it over, right? Uh, but I think that uh, we have to, that, that's a human thing. The point is that what kind of politics is going to take it over? And I would very much hope and feel that it is the new emerging sectors uh, of global civil society and communities in alliance with particular agencies and so on. That uh, do that. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. The spot. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to raise uh, some different issues regarding to the theme of this session: uh, emerging questions in Asian studies. Uh, can you hear? Me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to say that. We need to pay more attention to the studies of Asian cities and urbanism. Uh, today, most key keynote speakers talk about the necessity of what uh, uh, engage more transnational studies on uh, East Asia or Asia. That could be a way of, of uh, on, uh, for alternative approaches to Asian studies. So, I think another way for uh, of avoiding some dangers of ethnological nationalism could be a studies on studies of major cities and urbanism. Methodological nationalism can be avoided in two different ways. One is going moving upward to the transnational scale, but the other way is moving downward to the urban and local scale. Emphasis on connections and networks does not necessarily mean that we have to believe that the world is composed of just one single social space. The, the transnational should be seen as something composed of multiple social spaces constructed at different places and different geographical scales. Nation states are just one layer of these social spaces. Thus, transnational networks and flows need to be seen not as something even is uh, stretching out across uh, space, but as something unevenly connected to these multiple different social spaces and taking place across multiple geographical schemes. Thus, the transnational or trans-Asia as method of new Asian study need to pay attention not just to the international or interstate connections or relations but also to the inter-local and inter-urban connections and networks. And uh, maybe uh, this issue may be uh, indirectly address the question raised by Professor Shin Gigu. Uh, he raised the issue why we don't, uh, what, what we can do with the current uh, territorial conflict in East, Northeast Asia. Of course, it might be good we, if we can have an answer, immediate answer, solution to those questions as academia. But academic research cannot always uh, uh, find, find an immediate solution to real uh, world issues. And usually international issues, uh, area studies and regional studies tend to pay attention to the 
national scale issues and state level problems. But as I mentioned previously, in finding out the immediate solution is not what we always looking for. Right? Sometimes we try to develop some new ways of approach and imaginations uh, to see the world and some regional issues. And there, that new ways of approach could be a transnational as a, a, a method, trans Asia as a method. So in relation to that, uh, I propose just instead of paying attention to national level problems and issues and solutions, we can try to find some another level of issues, area, uh, ideas, <coughs> transnational, translocal, transurban kind of connection networks. That kind of imagination we need to find out. So in that regard, uh, Asian urbanism and Asian cities approach also need to be very much needed. Thank you. Uh, actually, I was uh, trying to pinpoint you to uh, respond to his question. Actually, uh, I wanted to link his uh, comments with your the idea of the central decentralizing okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. no. no, I, I fully agree with what you say. I think uh, it's very important uh, to think in go beyond these these kind of uh, boundaries, mental boundaries that we are feeling trapped into these, these borders. I mean, as far as we're doing, we're trying to do a different level. Uh, <clears throat> this, this ground that we got was partially aimed at shifting a lot of these, these boundaries, these intellectual boundaries. One of has to do with acknowledging this, the, the limitation of geographical compartmentalization of, of, of Asia. And, and we chose actually, so you can avoid addressing directly, as you mentioned, these, these border issues, but you can also address them in a different way. We have a, a we're supporting a network on borderlands <coughs> with uh, President <coughs> Bien Ban Chanda, I'm sorry, and all these scholars. So how, what it means to live on these borderlands that have been constructed often artificially in, in, in the last uh, century or so. So uh, that's a way to confront it directly. Another one I agree with you is, is the, the, the rising importance of cities. And, and, and cities is very important because it, it touches upon the local and, 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 and the global. It also opens new questions. I, we realize among, uh, we have a, a totally interdisciplinary network of scholars working on cities from people working on literature, archeology, span uh, history to uh, urban planners, architects, etc. And for instance, they identify connections that are not necessarily you know, coming up in our mind. For instance, there's more connection between Phnom Penh and a city in Africa than between uh, Phnom Penh and, and Tokyo, for instance. So <clears throat> it helps to de de territor territorialize a bit uh, uh, in this, this notion of Asia, and, and somehow it cools down a bit these, these constructions. Uh, the, the state construction. It, it also, of, also, I think the, the urban aspect is, is very interesting in terms of uh, giving a space for dealing with beyond academic uh, 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 pure um, uh, partners and, and dealing with local authorities. Uh, we have a series of in-situ roundtables uh, where we work with communities in a revitalization of, of an urban area. We did one in, in downtown Taipei, for instance. So in this case, we bring the scholars together with the local community as well as local um, uh, author uh, their authorities. And, and so I, I agree that that's a way to, so to decenter uh, uh, the way knowledge collection is, 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 is shaped in, in, in uh, classical academia. Of course, there are other ways. Uh, uh, we have two programs, one on, on Central Asia where Central Asia begins and ends, nobody knows. I mean, everybody argues. The problem is Central Asian scholars don't usually have a, a say in that. It's mostly scholars from Russia, from the uh, US, from Europe and Japan and so on. Uh, and likewise with the uh, Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal. Uh, so we can definitely identify concretely these kind of uh, topics, trans, uh, there are some topics that can really go uh, free us from these these uh, nation state uh, boundary uh, problematics. Okay, uh, two more scholars raised their hand, but uh, I wanted to take a full advantage of uh, my privilege as a chair of the session 
because uh, we won't talk about the Trans Asia, Transnational Asia, and then uh, partly is the very interesting question of this uh, transurban or uh, intercity uh, relationship. But uh, the, from the school, uh, the talk about family and family plan is a different level of analysis. You, you didn't spend, you, you spent only eight minutes, <laughs> two minutes left. So how do you link your family plan studies with the Asian studies in large? Thank you. If I may, I try to use this example to explain if you speak in Chinese, if you speak in the Indian language, or speak uh, in Russian, or Japanese, or Korean language, you, you have the own concept. Those concepts have the, like a tree, have the root uh, on your own ground. This ground will be a thousand years. So uh, uh, now we have uh, the uh, communication. In English is very convenient, but it's very difficult to explain by your own concept. Who is a, is a means of family, or it means individual person, or it means a you know, clan family, very big family. So in English, it's very difficult to find the word or vocabulary that can make this meaning. I try to use this example to explain why Chinese economic uh, situation in such a huge population and a slight uh, resource can make uh, something is cheaper. The cost is similar. Your human being is quite very similar. We are and you is quite similar. And it, uh, we are background, you know, maybe you, you didn't see it. You just say individual person, you just say this person has a right or duty. Uh, if they find they were together, they, they will become cost a lot. So uh, maybe it's so difficult to change our culture, like uh, Western culture, where, where our family, where our parents, or we give up their whole life for treating us, and uh, our generation will give up our, our time, our money, our treating our son and daughter. That's why Chinese only one children. Uh, and so this is a family strain will become a very strong social capital, will be put in an economic situation, will become a very, very Interest. I just try to make this really. I'm not sure I'm clear or not. Uh, can I make a follow up to Professor Wu? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, from your point, uh, we Asians, based upon our histories and different uh, historical experiences or everyday life, like Jia, the, the family in Chinese, uh, Jia, or uh, Japanese, uh, Ye or uh, Korean uh, Ka, it's the same uh, Chinese character. Uh, even though we have different connotations a little bit, comparing Chinese, Korean, Japanese, but it's hugely different from uh, Western ideas of family. We know that. But if we use the term family instead of Jia or Ie or Ka, uh, so what we need to do from uh, now on is we have to develop uh, what's the differences and we need to conceptualize rather than redefine family we need to define jia, ye, or chip, or kajo uh, there are several uh, attempts to do such kind of things but very few uh, so uh, if we do, don't do that uh, we cannot uh, the build up different kinds of knowledge. That's my the point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for your patience, uh, Professor Kell. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, the theme of this session is emerging questions in Asian studies, uh, and obviously you can uh, sort of address uh, that uh, question in different ways. We have talked about sort of interesting topical foci that can be addressed, useful analytical lenses that, that can be used, that, that process, concept, different conceptual approaches that can be used. But of course, there are also, so let's say, more generic uh, questions that can be looked at. And uh, this is more a comment really than a question. I would like to follow up on what Sidney uh, Young uh, said about the think tanks and the book searching 
we have said about uh, sort of how can uh, sort of Asian studies be useful in terms of addressing questions of territorial conflicts and reconciliation uh, in East Asia. I think one of the basic questions that each and every uh, Asian center uh, has to address is sort of what is its audience? Right? Because that has a major bearing on the kind of uh, strategy and, and, and performance uh, that we use. Right? Uh, if, if you uh, want to impact on academic discourses, right, uh, then you've got to adapt uh, or adopt uh, different strategies and, and, and formats than if you want to impact uh, on, let's say, public policy uh, or, or discourses that are relevant for, for the media, uh, for, for policy makers, uh, for, for business uh, uh, people. Uh, so um, I think it's just a vital question that, that everyone has to sort of, you know, uh, uh, be sort of very, very uh, careful uh, about uh, what, what is it really that, that you want to uh, achieve as an Asian Studies uh, Center. Do you want to impact on, on academic discourse? That, that's fine. But then you maybe also got to accept it that to a certain extent what you would do is sort of self-referential. Right? Uh, or is it that you want to sort of also address other uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, audiences and, and decision makers. Then you would have to adapt a different uh, strategy. And there are trade-offs because sort of the currencies and, and capitals uh, involved in, in these kinds of spaces are different. That has to be accepted. Thank you. Thank you. Not a principal. I think uh, we are missing some voices here. Uh, for example, we are talking about the emerging questions in Asian studies. But somehow I think, uh, look at all the speakers, we have so many founding fathers, but no mothers yet. And I think, uh, does it refer to some kind of traditional value of social orders in this Asian area? Because I think also gender issues is very important and emerging question as well. And also the second thing is we, I think we are missing here is a, a variety of voices here. We have many scholars from uh, China, Japan, and Korea, but we're missing some voices from Taiwan and Hong Kong. And I think since we are going to we try to emerge, engage that dialogue with each other, and try to go beyond the paradise, I think maybe uh, more diverse voices be included when we come to uh, further uh, specific in each of the studies. So I think uh, maybe gender issues and uh, voices from uh, some area who are missed here will be very critical and better to be involved in the future. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right, please. Uh, as a I'm kind of uh, surprised to hear in this uh, world about transnational or transnational because it was in kind of proposed idea of globalization or market and so forth. Now it's stopped in the economic world. And now we have to go to this. So I'm kind of confused. And, uh, because now all nation states are coming back to try to solve their own problem in national space big police measures. So now, so uh, the tendency toward the uh, liberalization and globalization has been kind of stuck because of, uh, after the, especially the crisis of 2009 and 2008 in, uh, in USA. So I don't know uh, how uh, the, the national transition can be a useful uh, unit of analysis for Asian studies for any country. So I don't know how the transition can suddenly uh, come out as a useful concept. I, I, I want to be persuaded or enacted by uh, as an economist. <laughs> and the thing about how the great school of international studies is uh, the business person. Uh, if, uh, as a political scientist, if we're all talking about the national controversies and others, why you have to only think about in terms of the national boundary? Go beyond it. So the economy is much beyond it, much earlier. <laughs> that uh, reminds me of uh, uh, your comment on this uh, subject. Uh, uh, I think the time is running. Is there any person who can eat lunch if you do not raise any question or comments? Okay. If not, uh, I wanted to like, wrap it up. I think that we... I wanted to link all the presentation with to the the original point that raised by Professor Pang and Liu about this transnational Asia is going beyond the national boundaries. And actually, Professor Baekhyun and Professor Yu are also talking about decentralizing Asia and transnational Asia, which we are talking about the, the the widening the boundary of Asia. But at the same time, Professor Yin uh, the 
So this is a very interesting idea of a kind of a, some kind of, we have to develop some uh, uniquely Asian perspective, which is not necessarily going against the Western conception of social science or uh, research. So how to combine uh, the research techniques developed in the West and then combine, the, combine it with the, uh, the contents and then the object of the study in East Asia is a kind of quite challenging for us. And I, uh, for me, the very interesting idea was this, suggested by Professor Hattigun is uh, rather than going beyond, uh, go, go behind and look at the local area in the city. Uh, rather than just uh, trying to go beyond, 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 and uh, reaching to the top. So it's a very interesting idea. So I think uh, uh, I, I myself learned a lot and then enjoyed this session. And uh, uh, I think it's a meaningful, meaningful start about thinking about how we study, study uh, the, the Asian problems in a, uh, from a new uh, angle. So uh, uh, I want to uh, please give uh, the big applause to all the panelists here. Thank you.